Good morning, Bad Park Church family. Um, it's just like old times, back on a computer screen, putting the sermon up on the, on the screen for you. Um, it's very much deja vu feeling this morning here, back to our COVID years. Um, Shayla and I both have a really bad flu that didn't feel wise to attend church, but did want to leave you hanging and uh, really wanted to share this section of scripture with you, um, even if I sound like this and look like this. So um, so you can open to Acts chapter 10. Um, if you're visiting with us, this is probably a weird thing. Uh, sorry that I'm not there to see you and chat with you in person, um, but I'm so thankful that you have come and that you on your holidays have, have come to worship Jesus and gather together as the saints. It's always a tr tremendous encouragement to us to see um, your commitment to the, to the church, uh, to the global church and to this local church. So last week we looked at uh, a pretty significant text, um, one that is often misused, and we spent a lot of time talking about that. The first kind of 33 verses of Acts chapter 10 are about uh, a guy named Cornelius and the Apostle Peter. And what we see is God's sovereignty at work in both the life of Cornelius to draw him to the Lord, to draw him to Jesus, and Peter to understand that what he already knows that the Gentiles are going to become part of the church, the implications of what that means has not been clear to him. And so there's still kind of a disconnect for Peter there. And so God's going to, God, we looked at last week, God used Cornelius to help Peter and Peter to help Cornelius uh, the way that God often does. Cornelius is a God-fearing man, um, well respected of by the Jews, serves the one true God, but doesn't know who Jesus is, at least not yet. And this morning we're going to see um, the, the short sermon that Peter preaches and how that impacts him and how he comes to faith and how the Gentiles are going to come into the church to be united together. Uh, Peter had this vision of a big sheet kind of descending down uh, with all these different animals on it and, and the voice and the vision said, take, kill, and eat. And he says, no, I've never eaten anything unclean. Um, and the, the voice says, what God has made clean, don't call unclean or do not call common, rather. And what we begin to see here is that Peter doesn't quite figure it out just yet, but on the journey um, to go back to Cornelius, he figures it out, um, that God accepts everyone. But there's a caveat for that, and this is the thing that we talked about a lot last week, is while Christ's sacrifice on the cross, his death and resurrection, is sufficient to pay the penalty for all sin and sufficient to welcome us into fellowship with God, there is something that we have to do, and that something is repentance. We have to confess our sin. We have to turn from our sin and seek to follow Jesus. And we looked at how in the New Testament it talks about God's goal for us is to become more like Christ. And in our culture, we've kind of switched it. And it, it's more like God's so loving, he just welcomes you in as you are. And you can just be who you are, be your one true authentic self. That kind of idea. But actually what the scriptures teach is, is come to God with all your hurts, with all your brokenness, with all the sin and the damage that sin has done. Repent of that and Jesus will restore you. And the Holy Spirit will indwell you and you will become more like Christ as we submit to the Spirit. And so it's not a sense of we come to Christ um, and he just accepts us as we are. We come to Christ and he radically changes us. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit this morning too, is have we radically been changed or have we just become a follower of Jesus but our life hasn't changed? Because then I wonder, are we actually following Jesus? So that's last week. So let's read together here this morning. We're going to read two different sections. We're going to read verse uh, 34 of chapter 10 to the end of the chapter. We're going to talk about that. 
And then we're going to quickly go over the next 18 verses of chapter 11, which is kind of a repeat um, said. Um, it's going to sound very familiar to last week, but it's God's word, and I don't want to skip over any of it. Um, so we are going to read it uh, together. But let's focus on these first few verses first. So starting in 34. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus, uh, pardon me, peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him uh, to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witness, uh, witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. It's a pretty, uh, pretty telling story here um, for, for a bunch of different reasons. But let's just walk our way through it just a little bit here. This first verse, uh, the grammar in the ESV might be a little tricky. So uh, I looked it up in the NIV and it says this. Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. And that's what we talked about last week, is God does accept us and welcome us in, but we have to repent, and then he radically changes us. So we need to repent, which is fear him, and we need to live for him, which is do what is right. The thing that I think is important for us to note, though, is, is Peter isn't saying to Cornelius, because you were seeking God, God has accepted you. Welcome into the family of God. Rather, what he's saying is, Cornelius, because you are seeking God, God is going to reward that seeking. We, we talked about that last week in Hebrews, that God diligently rewards those who seek him. But so now God's going to, through Peter, have the gospel declared, the gospel of Jesus, so that Cornelius can be forgiven of his sin and brought into the family of God. Peter begins this, uh, it's kind of a mini sermon. Uh, I'm, I'm certain that Luke uh, doesn't record the whole thing here, but the necessary parts for us to see. And so Peter says, right, that you yourselves know um, Cornelius, being a follower of the one true God, um, was aware of the historical realities of Jesus, who he was and what he did. But for Peter, there's something very important. Um, it's not just intellectual knowledge that's important. It's a relational knowledge that's important. In fact, Paul, uh, in Philippians 3, verses 10 to 11, says it this way that I may know him, that's Jesus, and the power of his resurrection, and that I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. 
is he wants to know Christ. Not just about Christ, but he wants to share in everything. The, the joys and the triumphs, but the persecution um, as well. Um, even even death itself. is That's the intimate knowledge that, that Paul talks about there and that Peter wants to have clear to Cornelius. I've got to be honest, this is really tricky to, to do uh, on, the, on the computer after so many years, so pardon me for this little, this little pause here. <clears throat> uh, Cornelius has heard about all that Jesus did, Peter is now seeking to not only confirm those things, but to make it personal. Peter tells him that it's not just hypothetical because he was there. He saw, he witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. He witnessed the teaching of Jesus. He witnessed um, post-cross Jesus, and not just him, but many others. In fact, in this little sermon here, scholars point out that Peter focuses a little more time here on this, excuse me, on this idea of resurrection body than the other sermons that we've read so far. Um, and, and probably the reason for that is, uh, to the Jews, that was not a new concept. And we talked about this a number of months ago. Some of the religious leaders rejected that there was a resurrection, but the concept was there, uh, and, and many of the Jews believed in it. Um, to the Gentiles, this was likely a brand new thing. This idea that you were welcomed into the family of God, but that you would get a resurrection body, that you would be restored um, to perfection with Jesus in eternity. Um, it, it's so much more than just saved from here and now, but saved for eternity. And then Peter says that Jesus then commissioned those uh, like himself who bore witness, who were there, in fact, he, he doesn't even say commissioned here. He says commanded the disciples. He commanded the disciples to preach that Jesus is the one who will be the final judge. Now, here's the thing. Again, it's said that Jesus is the judge. What will Jesus judge the world based on? Based on sin. Now, we, if, let me say that differently. If you have accepted Christ as your savior, if you've confessed Jesus as Lord, believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you are part of this family. And that means that your sin has not only been forgiven, but Jesus' righteousness has been imputed into you. Which means uh, on, on Jesus' behalf, when God sees us, he sees Jesus' righteousness, not our own sin. And so we get to share in that, which is impossible to, to truly grasp, but is a beautiful truth. And I don't know how, if we know that, how we wouldn't share that. I understand that sometimes there's fear, um, that sometimes there's persecution. But if we really understand salvation, what Jesus has saved us from and what he has saved us for, and this is where that radical change comes in. I might be shy, I might be nervous, I might be scared, I might fill in the blank. But I submit to the power of the Holy Spirit and he uses me to accomplish his purposes, not because of my gifts or talents or abilities, but because I've been changed, because I'm not who I was anymore. And this is one of the things about today's world that is so different to the scriptures is the focus here in our world is you are who you are and you should be proud of that. And the scriptures are, you are who you are and yet God has saved you. He saved you from that, from the power of sin, from the consequences of sin, and he's radically changing you to become more like him. He's going to judge the world. And Peter wraps up this uh, verse 43 by saying, Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. This should remind us back to Acts uh, 4, verse 12, which we looked at back in the beginning of March. It says there, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
It's only through Jesus that we're saved. But we can have the confidence that everyone, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness. Now, this is where that believes in him. Do we know Christ or do we just know about him? We want to know him. Peter's small, relatively small sermon here is in keeping with the other sermons he preached in Acts so far, except there are some slight differences as he uh, preaches to a, a new audience, a Gentile audience, one that he's probably not fully prepared and doesn't fully understand all the implications to yet. But what happens here in verse 44 is meant to, it's really meant to surprise us and maybe shock us. Um, and again, I think for the first century, Jew and Gentile person reading a text like this, it, it would have done that. We live so far removed from that, sometimes maybe we don't see it. But Luke writes that while Peter was still saying these things, while Peter's still, <coughs> excuse me, while Peter is still um, explaining the gospel of Jesus, it says the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. While Peter's still talking, the Spirit descends and indwells this group of Gentile people. And I think it's really interesting to think about this in this first century context and, and the details that Luke gives us here is the group of Gentiles, the six men with Peter, are shocked by what happens. I guess my question is, haven't they been sitting there listening to Peter preach? Haven't they heard that God doesn't show favoritism? Do they agree with him? Do they disagree? Are they upset with Peter for what he's preaching? Or do they agree in theory, but like Peter, have not yet fully understood its implications? There's something very significant and important um, here for us to see. And, and this is going to last for a few more chapters yet. Uh, we're going to read a little bit more of that in the next chapter. So before we get there, though, <coughs> scholars refer to this as the Gentile Pentecost. So just like in Acts 2 when the Pentecost um, sorry, when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and indwelled all the believers and they began to speak in other languages, the exact same thing happens here. Um, and it's interesting. John Polhill uh, has a really, uh, I've quoted him lots in his commentary for Acts because he's got some really good insights. But he says this, only an undeniable demonstration of divine power could overrule all these Jewish objections to the Gentiles coming to faith. God provided precisely that in Cornelius' home. We're going to see that as we read uh, chapter 11 in just a few moments here. Is that for the Gentiles to come in, this wasn't to come into the church, this wasn't just going to happen a little bit here and a little bit there. There was going to be a, a big moment. And that's why the scholars call this uh, Gentile Pentecost. Is It's the exact same thing. Maybe not quite to the same scope initially, but certainly is, is about to spread like crazy. Um, this text is meant to help us see that there's no difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. That the cross of Jesus unifies us together as men and women um, born in different places, different cultures, different backgrounds. And yet God doesn't discriminate based on that. God welcomes us all in. Well, he invites us all in. But then it's up to us to repent. Peter witnesses the Holy Spirit coming on them. And his response is beautiful. Um, in fact, there's a kind of a nerdy detail here in the Greek that should remind us back to the Ethiopian eunuch in, in chapter 8. Uh, in, in both these instances, the question that gets asked is, what prevents them from being baptized? In, in other words, um, what prevents their full inclusion into the family of God? We can't just watch the Holy Spirit come on them and go, oh, I guess, I guess they're saved. They need to 
almost in a sense confirm that welcome them in and so peter says okay we got to baptize them like and so he kind of says like who 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 can uh, withhold water for baptism and then notice the last bit of what he says there they have received the holy spirit just as we have there's no distinction any longer now peter doesn't fully yet get that or maybe more accurate to say is he's going to forget that as we go forward in the in the text in, uh, in the coming weeks ahead but for this moment anyway he he gets it he sees it they should be welcomed in and then we read that peter stayed with them um, for some days we don't know how long presumably cornelius wanted to learn more about jesus not not um not because what he had heard wasn't sufficient but that he just wanted to grow more and more. Um, and I think the same should be true of us, is if, if we, how do I say this? If we don't have a hunger to learn more about Jesus, then we probably don't fully grasp who Jesus is. Well, we never fully grasp. But I guess we're not seeing the beauty of who Jesus is. So we need to read scripture. We need to study and see God's character revealed to us because in that we see the beauty of a God who loves us, who planned salvation right from the beginning so that we would be restored together with God's people, united in purpose and in meaning to declare the gospel to the nations. Okay, so let's go to chapter 11 here. I'm just going to make a couple of comments uh, here. Um, but I want to read this text again because this is God's uh, inspired word written for us, so we don't want to skip it. Chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party, circumcision party critiqued him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them? But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance, I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea, and the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. We told, sorry, and he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved. You notice that? Not might, that you will be saved by this message. Just as on, oh, pardon me, uh, you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent. They glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. So it's interesting because there's this group of Jewish people, right, in the, the fact that they're called the circumcision party seems to indicate that there was kind of this nationalistic sense in them that the Jews are God's people, not anybody else. Um, and people were always, in the Old Testament, you could become a Jew. You had to go through the process of circumcision. You had to you know, observe the Torah. You had to do the ceremonial eating and cleaning and washing, all those kinds of things. You could be um, welcomed into the Jewish land, but you had to do those things. And that seems to be what this group is going. It's like, well, you, you can't, you can't eat with unclean people. They gotta 
fix their sin. They got to deal with their stuff first and then they can be welcomed into us, which we know is the exact opposite of the gospel. The gospel is that we come to God with our sin, we repent of that sin and he forgives us. We don't fix our lives first. We can't. That's why we need a savior. And so this circumcision party is upset with Peter. Now, I think it's important to note this, is it's not as though, how do I say this? It's not as though that it's Peter against these group of people is in all likelihood when Peter last spoke with these groups of Jewish people, he believed the same thing. That yeah, Gentiles would be preached to, but they would need to come to the Jewish faith first. And through this vision that he had now uh, seen on the oh, before going to Cornelius, is he was starting to see and understand that that was not the case. Um, because it was God who orchestrated their salvation. It was God who poured out the Holy Spirit on them at the Gentile Pentecost. It was God who was doing these things, not Peter. And so when they opposed him, I think there should be a little bit of sympathy in the sense of like, they're going, Peter, you're, you've, you've abandoned us here. Like you used to believe the same thing we did. And I think this is what happens with the gospel of Jesus. Is the gospel of Jesus is radical. It means that we're to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute you, to wish well to those people. We, when we're attacked so often, we demand justice. But what we should be praying for is that they would encounter Jesus. Not so that our suffering stops, but so that they would see who Jesus is. And I think that's a hard thing for us from time to time, or maybe often. But here, Peter is now in this tricky spot. And so I like how he words it. He says in uh, verse 3, well, sorry, verse 4, but Peter began and explained it to them in order. It's like, okay, guys, hold on. Here's what happened. And then he tells the story. I was over here doing my own thing. A vision came to me, declaring to me a radical truth. And I said, no, I'm not going to eat this. But it happened three times. Do not. Do not call uh, uncommon or unclean what God has declared clean. And so for him to process that and see that, that, that was a challenge for him. And then when he went, and now he says, it's not just me. These six other Jewish people, they came with me. And, and God told me that I was to preach a gospel that would bring them to salvation. And it had nothing to do with the ceremonial food laws. It had nothing to do with observance of the laws. It had everything to do with confession, repentance, and then an indwelling of the Spirit to walk in Jesus, to walk new in Jesus. And so he lays that out for them. There's something uh, that... I couldn't get up. I, I couldn't help but not see this week. When, when Peter says here in verse uh, 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remember the word of the Lord, how John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus, who was I that I could stand in God's way? I think that's a very important sentence for a couple of reasons. One is I think Peter's recognizing that salvation is a work of God, not a work of us. That's important. That we would see that it's Christ that saves us. That it's not because we are good in and of ourselves that we're worth saving, but because God loves us. And he has offered us a chance at redemption through the blood of Jesus. But then secondly, um, he also goes, there's a couple of times where he unifies himself with them. The Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. If then God gave the same gift to them that he gave to us, he's identifying them together, which I think is very important. He's beginning to see and understand the unity that exists there. But then, and this I think is, this was the biggest one for me this week as I was studying 
when he says, if then, verse 17, God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us, when we believed in the same, sorry, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? And I was reminded back of something that we read um, back in uh, chapter 5 when Peter and the apostles are, are declaring the good news of Jesus at this point still just to the Jewish people. And the Jewish religious leaders are very upset because they have rejected Jesus as Messiah. But this movement is growing and the religious leaders are scared. They're worried about what's going to happen. And a man named Gamaliel says, this is verse 35, 38, 39. He says, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men, Peter and the apostles. If this plan or undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. And then he says this, verse 39, You might even be found opposing God. And now we have that same thing here in chapter 11. And I think there's significance there because Gamaliel... Um, we don't know very much about him, but we see the wisdom. We see the wisdom in um, him recognizing that if this is of God, then he needs to get on board with that. He needs to allow God to be God and him to be a human that submits to God. And he says, if, if, it, if it is of God, we won't be able to overthrow it, and then we'll be found opposing God. And so what Peter is saying here is in the same way, he's saying, look, look what God did. He brought the Holy Spirit. He indwelled them. They are united. This Gentile group is united in fellowship with us. We are the same. And I don't dare stand in God's way opposing God who brings who he will to faith in Jesus Christ. And I think that's important for us. It's important for us because I think, again, we sometimes really want justice. When we read a, an article online about some awful tragedy that happened, or we see someone doing some awful things to people in our world, children, whatever it might be, it can be so easy to call out for God's righteous vindication and judgment. When what we should be calling out for is recognizing that God loves them and God wants to bring them to salvation. Now, they, they have to either choose to repent or not, but you and I need to bear witness. Like I said earlier, we are commissioned, but Peter goes even further and says we are commanded to declare the good news of Jesus. And so let me go back to something I said right at the beginning as we close here. Has Jesus radically changed you? Or is Jesus just a part of your life that really doesn't make your life look a whole bunch different other than maybe you go to church on Sunday. Maybe you go to Bible study on a, on a certain weeknight. Maybe you attend a prayer meeting from time to time. But has he changed your heart? Has he radically changed who you are and so that how you think, how you see people, how you respond to situations is different have you been given a new heart because that's what it means to know Christ that's what it means to repent and turn towards him and that's my prayer for us that we would see and that we would understand that thank you um, for bearing with me with this I actually don't know that you did maybe maybe the tech didn't work and everybody went home early I, I have no idea I guess I'll find out later in the week but let me pray for us uh, as we go. God, thank you that you are a God who loves us and you have made a way for us to be brought to Jesus so that we could be forgiven of our sins, so that your righteousness can be imputed into us and so that we can be with you for all of eternity in perfection. God, may we really understand the gospel. May that change how we live in every aspect of our life. When we face temptation, when we face uncertainty, when we face hurt or confusion, may we respond in a whole different way because of the love of Jesus Christ. And may we seek to share that love of Jesus Christ with everyone that we meet. 
God, give us the courage and the boldness to do that. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for this church, for this group of people, for those that have come today. Bless them as we go from this place. We love you. Thank you for salvation. Amen. All right, well, I hope you have a great week, and I look forward to actually seeing you next week because I tell you, this is its too much deja vu for me. Have a wonderful week, everyone. Bye-bye.